Welcome back. Thank you, Dr. Kuo, for that great topic uh, and the great uh, lecture on the medical management of gastroparesis. We have Dr. Kumar Krishnan, who is my co-director of this course. You've seen him many times. Uh, he's an assistant professor at the Harvard Medical School and a very experienced interventional gastroenterologist at Mass General. He's going to be talking about the endoscopic management of gastroparesis. Over to Dr. Krishnan. All right, thank you, uh, Charu. So um, we all heard a, a wonderful talk uh, sort of on the medical management of gastroparesis. Um, and I'm gonna talk about an area that really has received a tremendous amount of uh, attention, especially uh, from the innovation piece of how we deal with poor gut disease. And that is endoscopic therapies for gastroparesis. So um, Dr. Kuo mentioned uh, in some detail uh, about the mechanism of symptom generation. And I'm certainly not an expert in this space, but I think that if you are going to be somebody who, who is going to offer therapies um, for gastroparesis, to some degree, you have to understand how do these patients uh, develop symptoms. And, and you can dumb it down to say sort of three main categories. The first is impaired fundic relaxation. So uh, patients with gastroparesis, they don't get that same satisfying feeling after eating a large meal. In fact, they get the opposite. They feel terrible after eating a large meal. And that's largely the result of impaired fundic relaxation. Um, in addition, they have uh, antral hypomotility um, and they have some degree of pylorospasm. <clears throat> and the degree of pylorospasm is relative. So for example, if they had robust uh, antral motility, then you probably could tolerate a little bit more pylorospasm. However, if you have significant hypomotility, you probably uh, would not be able to tolerate as much uh, pylorospasm. So these are the kind of the three main components of how they develop symptoms. And what are these symptoms? Well, we all know them because we all probably see these patients. They have early satiety, they have postprandial fullness, the dreaded nausea, nausea um, that we hear in clinic, they have pain, vomiting, regurgitation, and bloating. And I do want to say I could provide this list of symptoms for patients who also have dyspepsia. And I think that's something Dr. Quo mentioned, that these are in no way specific for gastroparesis. So developing that uh, very ideal diagnostic testing uh, is, is critically important, especially as we're going to start to offer therapy. So Dr. Quo went through a very comprehensive list about medical therapies and clinical trials that are available. Well, what about procedural therapies? I think the, the frustration in trying to get these patients better has resulted in interest in uh, offering sort of non-pharmacotherapy. And you have sort of two sides of treatment. You have on one edge, uh, surgical uh, therapies like gastrectomy, gastric bypass, and pacemakers. And then on the other side, you have endoscopic therapies like Botox, pyloric dilation, pyloric stenting, et cetera. So we're going to hear a talk about surgery, and, and to be somewhat provocative, I'm going to tell you why surgery fails in these patients. Um, part of the reason is that most of these patients have functional hypersensitivity. So uh, manipulating their normal anatomy will usually result in some other symptom that you'll have to deal with. Uh, there is a risk of further neuroenteric injury. If the symptoms are relate, related to uh, impaired accommodation, anything that decreases their stomach will make them miserable. So these are the patients who we don't want to offer gastric bypass and gastrectomy. And it goes without saying that the stomach is not the heart. Uh, electrical stimulation is not going to work alone. But um, to be somewhat uh, fair, why does endoscopy fail? Um, well, I think similar to achalasia, simple uh, hydrostatic dilation of the pylorus is simply not effective. Um, Botox uh, injection does not really result in adequate uh, sustained dilatation of smooth muscle to treat pyloraspasms. But why do we offer them? Well, historically, they've been safe um, to do endoscopic therapy, but they just simply lacked efficacy. So what is the rationale for pyloric-directed therapy when I mentioned there's sort of three different ways that we can treat this? Well, from a technical standpoint, it's the most reliable. Uh, I mean, we can't improve fundic uh, uh, accommodation. We can't necessarily improve motility. You just recently saw the whole complicated neuroenteric connection. So the pylorus is really technically the only uh, uh, area of the stomach that we can impact reliably. 
So what's the data on this? So you heard a little bit about the Botox trial. There are two RCTs on Botox, both of them uh, essentially negative, not showing any benefit of Botox over placebo. What about dilation and stenting? You're going to see a lot in the literature about a small case series and studies about dilation uh, of the pylorus and even stenting of the pylorus. And I want to highlight there's no quality studies investigating the impact of this. These are case reports with marginal efficacy. And I want to point out that they are not um, uh, inexpensive. Uh, putting in esophageal stents across the pylorus and then ultimately having to fix them with either suturing systems, using sometimes luminoposing stents, these are incredibly expensive uh, test interventions. And so I really don't think that there's adequate data to support their use. What about surgical pyloromyotomy? Um, this has been done for many, many years. We have excellent surgeons on the panel who you will hear from, um, but there are uh, no randomized controlled trials. However, this is the, one of the largest prospective studies of this, 177 patients with gastroparesis, 86% um, uh, improvement in gastric emptying, sustained improvement in symptom score. So some objective and some subjective improvement uh, in these patients. However, the median length of stay of about four days, 7% morbidity, and about a 1% leak rate not terribly high, but probably um, not what we would want in a benign condition like gastroparesis. So the question comes, can we obtain surgical efficacy at pyloric disruption with that endoscopic safety that we are accustomed to? And the answer is perhaps yes. So this is a cartoon that depicts uh, the peroral pyloromyotomy procedure or the POP procedure. It's also referred to as G-POEM uh, in, in some uh, studies. Um, in a very similar way to POEM that you, some of you have seen yesterday, um, using an endoscope, you create a submucosal uh, injection, a bleb to create a pocket. Um, you can enter that pocket after performing a mucosotomy. Once you enter that submucosal space, you perform a little bit of submucosal dissection until you get to the py pylorus, and then you can divide the pylorus and close up your entry site. Now, some people do what's uh, shown here, which is the lesser curvature approach. But there is also a greater curvature approach that some people do, no head-to-head -head studies. But uh, in general, we find this to be a much more streamlined, uh, straightforward uh, procedure compared to the greater curvature approach. What does this look like? Um, here's a short uh, video. Here's the submucosal injection. It's just methylene blue um, with uh, the, in, in saline. Here we're using a triangle tip knife to make a horizontal mucosotomy. So unlike POEM, where we make a longitudinal mucosotomy, here we make a horizontal mucosotomy. Um, the antrum is quite thick, so sometimes it takes a little bit more to get into that submucosal space. Um, using the cap-fitted gastroscope, we just do a little bit of submucosal dissection. Um, and really, uh, the pylorus almost finds you. So here, with a little bit of air insufflation, we can start to see that pyloric ring. And then using a little bit of dissection, we can really uh, define that pyloric ring. And again, either using uh, spray coagulation or um, uh, more of a cutting current, we can divide the muscle fibers from distal to proximal. We usually try to take the, the muscle fibers a little bit into the antrum, maybe one to two centimeters into the antrum. And then at the end of the case, we can close our, um, our entry site with a handful of hemostatic clips. So really, I, I think a, a straightforward procedure um, almost about a 30 to 40 minute procedure um, uh, to accomplish this. Let's skip ahead. So what's the efficacy? You're going to see a lot of different studies on uh, pyloromyotomy. This uh, was published from the Cleveland Clinic Group. Still, I think the largest study, 100 patients with refractory gastroparesis, um, they note a 1.5 point improvement in GCSI. Uh, many of them had improvements in gastric emptying, and this was sustained at six months. Um, and since then, there have been a lot of smaller studies that at least have shown that this technique is safe, it's feasible, and it has some degree of efficacy. How does it compare to laparoscopic or surgical pyloroplasty? So this is the same Cleveland Clinic group that compared their POP patients to a surgical group. And you can see um, that the mean operative time was significantly less, blood loss significantly less, trend to fewer complications, and unplanned ICU admissions. So while the outcomes uh, clinically were similar, the morbidity was less with the POP procedure. Can you use this in other situations? The answer is yes. It's a little bit more challenging. 
This is a patient after an esophagectomy. Uh, many of us have seen these types of patients who have significant severe gastroparesis. Um, you can still offer the POP procedure. It's a little different after somebody has had preoperative radiation. But again, uh, this is uh, uh, us using the lesser curvature approach. Um, the dissection is a little bit more involved. Uh, it's a little bit more fibrotic. But as long as you define your plane, you know where the pylorus is, we really try to go kind of uh, one layer by one layer, uh, remove the fibrotic uh, submucosa until we can find our uh, pyloric ring. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward uh, through this a little bit. So one of the questions that uh, Dr. Kuo uh, brought up is, who's gonna benefit from these pyloric directed therapies? And, and uh, I would say probably two or three years ago, I probably shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know, we'll just see who, who responds. But um, that's quickly changing with the development of endoflip. Um, some of you uh, have seen endoflip. We had two great talks about endoflip uh, yesterday. Um, and it's well validated in the evaluation of patients who have achalasia. But there is now a growing body of data that we can use endoflip to assess distensibility of the pylorus. And there is now normative data that's been published. It appears that a distensibility index between 8 and 10 is sort of the cutoff for pathologic uh, pylorus spasm in those patients who have uh, uh, gastroparesis. So this study, uh, which was published uh, out of Europe, was a prospective trial of 20 patients with gastroparesis. They noted two-point improvement in GCSI from baseline, but they noted that an abnormal baseline pyloric distensibility using endoflip had a specificity and sensitivity of 172% suggesting that we can now start to select patients who would respond to pyloric-directed therapy. And there have been other similar studies using Botox. So using endoflip, you can actually tailor who may respond to Botox. This was uh, a more recent study, 80 patients, prospective multicenter study, showing uh, improvements at 12 months uh, with GCSI at 50, uh, clinical success of 56% which doesn't sound like a lot, but this is a pretty big deal for gastroparesis patients. Um, improvement uh, overall in GCSI, very few adverse events. I almost wouldn't even consider capnoperitoneum an adverse event anymore. Um, their predictors of success was uh, greater than 20% retention at baseline, response at one month, and a higher GCSI at baseline. This was a very recent study that was published by the group in Indiana. Um, I thought a very, very well done study. 52 patients with refractory gastroparesis. They followed them for a couple of years. Um, they did, uh, gave them several validated questionnaires uh, for gastroparesis, PAGI SIM and GCSI. They showed an improvement in quality of life at six months. They did not notice any difference between the, etiolo the baseline etiology of um, gastroparesis, indicating that all the patients did have some improvement. They looked at their pyloric distensibility pre and post. So the blue is pre, where they were between six and eight. And you can see improvement, objective improvement in, uh, in pyloric distensibility. So really just showing that this technique does accomplish what we want it to accomplish, which is relieve pyloric spasm. One of the most uh, insightful parts of what they showed was healthcare utilization of these patients. We all have seen these patients in the ER, in the clinic, they have significant symptoms. They, uh, they, you, there's a, they are a high healthcare utilization cohort. Um, and what they show that compared to baseline, six months, 12 months, 24 months, there was a significant decrease in ER visits. So zero ER visits in their POP patients uh, and zero hospitalizations at 24 months. I think very, very important finding. Just a couple of pearls of uh, POP in my last minute. Um, just like we heard about with re anti-reflux procedures, patient selection is key. You have to define what their symptoms are. Um, understand their anatomy. You can do POP in some of these post-operative patients, such as esophagectomy, like I showed, uh, uh, pyloric sparing whipples, even sleeve patients, but these are a little bit more complicated, so don't expect them to be straightforward. Many patients report worse symptoms a few days up to a week after POP. And I suspect a lot of that is just edema at the uh, pylorus, but be prepared for it, have a protocol to deal with it. Um, have a standardized post-op management. We had an excellent APP session. Um, this is a great role to incorporate an APP into your practice. 
make sure there's not a distal obstruction or small bowel or colonic dysmotility before you do a pop. Um, this is something that Dr. Kuo had mentioned in part of the workup. So in summary, um, these patients are complicated. They're, the mechanism of symptom generation is complicated. Medical treatments, we heard a lot about medical treatments, but really there is not the same level of evidence to support medical therapy. They lack efficacy, they lack tolerance, they have side effects. POP has really emerged as a minimally invasive treatment for select patients with gastroparesis, especially those who have pyloraspasm. And now with endoflip, we have the ability to select patients who we think will uh, respond. And getting to uh, Dr. Kuo's point, I think that there will be uh, an enormous amount of data uh, coming ahead to really show that this is gonna be the primary therapy for many patients who have gastroparesis. Thank you.